People are stupid. Live to tape. <laughs> Welcome to Millennial 514. I'm Andrew. I'm Maura. I'm Pamela. Actually, I think this is 515. I just did not update oh, that number. My God, <laughs> you're fired. We are joined by one of our Patreon supporters this week, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hi, how's it going? Good. How are you? Oh, you know, good. Just uh, recovering from a bachelorette weekend in Santa Barbara. Ooh, any fun Ooh. stories from that? <laughs> um yeah <laughs> um it's definitely we like we started drinking at 6 a.m on the train we took the train from san diego up to santa barbara so um the bride is an investor in bootcraft and so we got started with some bootcraft at about six o'clock in the morning it's a it's an alcoholic kombucha oh my so it actually gives you no hangover and it, and it doesn't actually, it, it's act a little bit healthier than just your regular booze. No hangover and healthier. This sounds something like something I should try. The big question is, were there any strippers? <laughs> no, there was a chicken head though. What? What, what is that? <laughs> so, um, so at every bachelorette party with this particular bride for like my bachelorette party, she had, um, uh, our mascot was uh, a dong bong. It was like a big beer bong with like a penis at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so she forgot it this year for her own bachelorette party. And so, um, on the first night that we were, um, going out, um, two of our friends, like, fell back behind the group and disappeared. And when they came, like, rejoined us, one of them had like this chicken headed mask. <laughs> and and so for the rest of the night there were like videos of the chicken dancing in the middle of the road on state street which is like downtown santa barbara and it was a good time it was a good time oh my gosh well that's much better than what i imagined so when you first said there was a chicken head you know the <laughs> pikachu meme when pikachu is like he's got that face like uh I made that face. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, where is this going? We heard that noise you made too. That was hilarious. Yeah. You know, I, I, I understand that Oprah spends a lot of time in Santa Barbara. I'm just praying that she wasn't driving on State Street and saw a couple of women running around with chicken heads on. Uh, well, the, the the funny the funny part of this is at the end of the night we were walking back we walk we're walking back into the hotel and Jeff Bridges is standing out front. Waiting for his taxi. <laughs> was he hey, drinking ladies. a white Russian? <laughs> no, but he was literally dressed like the dude. He was wearing slip-ons oh. and the cardigan, and he had the full beard. And the girl who bought the chicken head like goes up to him, and she's like, "Are you Kurt Russell?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and then um one of the other girls we were with was with us she was so wasted she goes who who the hell are you and i was oh just like god. oh my god come on like let's go get leave him alone and um was able to corral them away from him but uh but one of my friends got got a hug from him and uh it was pretty funny that's crazy <laughs> he probably appreciated it yeah. I hope so, except that he told um, he told the second girl that he was Billy Bob Thornton. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, amazing. That's great. Switching gears, I know you wanted to talk about this. The Notre Dame Cathedral burned. Yeah, this, this has just been so heartbreaking. Yeah. So the big steeple, that fell, and it was but called yeah. on video, pretty striking video. The latest is that the cathedral has been saved. Because the two big towers will still stand, but two thirds of the of the roof are gone, and obviously there's going to be a lot of uh, construction to get this thing back together. But uh, Sarah, what did you want to say about it? There are actually multiple Notre Dame cathedrals all over the world. Um, this is the one that's the most notable because it's on the Ile de la City, and it's um it's a classic example of Gothic architecture gothic church architecture um and part of the the part of the design that was so revolutionary were the flying buttresses that were 
put on the outside to hold up the walls because there was so much stained glass in the in the walls that they needed more stability. And um, and so they had been it's been remodeled. It was remodeled after 1225. And um, and so a lot of it was falling apart. And that's why it was being remodeled. And Mm -hmm. um, they had removed a lot of the glass for remodeling. They removed about 800 works before this happened. Hmm. But um, it's just absolutely it's just I I was um, I was there in 2012. So I was lucky enough to see it before. It's yeah. a really tragic accident. And you know all of this because you have a degree in art history. That's correct. I have a degree in art history with a focus in um, Renaissance masters. So you make my pronunciation of the cathedral sound like shit compared to yours. Well, <laughs> the Notre well, but Dame. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also speak French, so that oh. is part of it. Yeah. Oh, well, fuck me. Good for you. <laughs> Why did you pick Thank up you. French? When did you do that? My dad is um, my dad is the son of Belgian immigrants. His first language was French. I have family that live in Paris that are um, that are very uh, I, they're very nice people and um, and so I I learned French so that I could communicate with my family. Mm. Um, I also I do also speak Spanish, but not as good as Laura does. I just speak a oh. I, I probably speak a kitchen Spanish. <laughs> yeah, but you already know another romance language, so that definitely lends itself to being skilled in Spanish. Absolutely, I, I would say that I because I took a I took one Spanish class in college and failed for lack of attendance, and then um, I picked and then so the basic structure I had learned already, and then working with Mexicans in a kitchen, they were very kind enough to teach me a lot of their you know, more colloquial terms. And, and so I was able to learn a lot just, just when I was managing, managing a restaurant. Hmm. Well, so. I think Pam probably speaks better Spanish than anyone on this panel. Oh, that's probably true. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry, You might Pam. be surprised. I'm a little rusty. <laughs> so uh, Sarah is passionate about using marijuana as an alternate to traditional anti-depression medications and I know you just like using it to relax as well. So we're going to talk about that later in the episode, where marijuana is uh, in America today, where it's going, our experience with it, etc. We are recording on April 15th. It is tax day. Laura, how's it been for you? Um, well, I, I will say the marijuana comes in handy on <laughs> days like this. Um, This year is not a fun tax year for a lot of folks um, because we can no longer itemize. Uh, I'm one of the people affected by this. So in past years, I was able to itemize. And this played a significant part in me getting a return instead of owing. And this year I owed quite a bit. (laughs) I don't even want to talk about it. Um, So yeah, it kind of sucks. I got my paycheck this morning, but I was also like, that's not going to be there long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I spoke about this a month or two ago on the show. My accountant, credit to her, does the taxes very early. Like as soon as (laughs) the new year rolls around, she is on it. Like I think we filed by like end of January. And, uh, oh my God, it was so much for Hypable Media Inc., which is an S-Corp in California. It it was more than ever, and I don't blame Trump necessarily. We had a good year, but any any uh, profits we thought we could enjoy were just wiped because they're all going to the fucking government. And it just bums me out because I really don't know, and I said this on Millennial previously, I don't know how businesses get ahead in this country. You're, it, it just feels like you're being punished. You made money. Great. Now give it all to us. What do you think about the stories that are saying that a lot of these larger corporations aren't paying any taxes? Yeah, well, I think it's awful and doesn't surprise me. And how do I do that? <laughs> well, and that, that was kind of the upshot of this new tax bill was that all of the tax cuts actually ended up going to the top 1%. Mm-hmm. And the standard deductions just doubled for single people and married spouses uh, filing jointly. So now it's not as easy to itemize, which is really what helps you save money. Yeah. 
Because like it used to be for a single person, the standard deduction was like six thousand or sixty five hundred, and now it's twelve thousand. Yeah, Pam, um, I'm sure you get fucked too because you do a lot of freelance. Yes, yes, but that's like I was kind of expecting it. Right. I, I I get fucked every year. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, New Year, same shit. (laughs) Exactly. But that's why it's important. And I'm sure, like, since you do, since this does happen every year, you know to plan for it accordingly. So hopefully it's not, like, a big shock. Yeah, I try. Like, the first, um, it takes a while, though, because sometimes, like, even if you, like, you know, over-prepare, there's still some stuff that comes up. You're like, oh, shit, you know? Or, like obviously like i have, i try to have as much of a savings as i can but sometimes you know if something big happens like i got into a car accident um then you know i might have to dip into the money i've been putting away for tax right. season and then you just have to like replenish and stuff like that so yeah it's it's a game it's a one big game yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of screwed up that you have to have savings for taxes it really is <laughs> mm-hmm my grandmother's property taxes are twelve thousand dollars a year. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah, she lives, but she lives west of the five five minutes walking distance from the beach. So that's pretty much. She has a two million dollar home, and they and that's why in California. Mm. Oh well, maybe I don't feel bad for her then if she has a two million. <laughs> I guess that I guess that's all relative. My property <laughs> taxes are like nine hundred dollars a year. <laughs> Mine are. I've got it right here. Four thousand, I guess. I don't know. What's the bill for every six months? Yeah. Usually yeah. get billed for it twice a year. Yeah. Okay. So mine are about 4000 a year. The Mueller report is going to be coming out Thursday in a redacted form. And we wanted to let everybody know we will be doing a breaking news. I think you usually go breaking news. Breaking news. But yeah. <laughs> That's how it should be. Gotta scream it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very Billy on the streets of you. <laughs> We're going to be doing a breaking news installment soon after the release of the report because we want to have some time to at least give it a good thorough skim so that we can provide some analysis. Sure. So keep an eye on our social feeds and we'll let you know when that's coming. That'll be available to $10 patrons over at patreon.com slash millennial. I am leaving the country on Thursday night, so I I guess I'm getting out of here at a good time because I think this report is going to drive, drive people crazy. Uh, the question is, are you coming back? Uh, if Trump lets me back in, sure. <laughs> I was going to say, this might be your chance, Andrew. No, I got it. No, I got to come back. I'm getting my Tesla on Wednesday. I'm going to have one whole day with it, and then I'm leaving the country. I need to spend more time <laughs> um, with it. <laughs> something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the thing that's going to get me a federal tax credit next year. <laughs> I had an interesting weekend. I went to Star Wars Celebration. This is the big annual Star Wars convention. This year was in Chicago. And Disney emailed me like, hey, you're in Chicago, right? Do you want to come? And I was like, A, I didn't know you knew I was in Chicago. And B, sure. So I went to a few of the big panels. I went to the Episode Nine panel, and that's where they revealed the title, which is The Rise of Skywalker. And they dropped the first trailer as well also went to a panel on galaxy's edge the new disneyland and disney world theme park lands they look awesome and and a panel on the mandalorian which is the new disney plus live action star wars series which also looks very good they shared a lot of footage john favaro was there uh he put on a really fun panel with uh, his co-creator and the co-stars and the stars of the series did you all watch the rise of skywalker trailer heck yeah Mm -hmm. it looks really good right yeah i'm excited i got some chills i think one of the biggest things that stood out to me and they were emphasizing this at the panel is that all the characters are going to be together in this film like ray finn poe chewbacca c-3po they kind of have to right yeah but this is like the first time so that's cool. Mm-hmm. But I guess the big question is, what does the rise of Skywalker mean? What are y'all's theories? I have heard two theories. One is that um, Palpatine cloned Luke from his hand and Ray is the rejected clone. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was a funny one. And then the other one is like instead of the Jedi's, it's a new it's a new class of Jedi called the Skywalker. That was that second theory is closer to what a theory that I like. Skywalker is more of a movement now, and it's kind of hinted at at the end of The Last Jedi because you see some kids looking up into the sky and they say something that is related to Skywalker or the resistance. Um, and maybe Skywalker is it's not a person. It is just a movement. It is the new resistance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that would kind of make sense, too, because if you think about it, Ray would be the closest thing they have right now to fully grown. Right. And the difference between her and and what, you know, Obi-Wan was trying to teach Luke and what went wrong with um, Anakin is that they were kind of deterred from feeling anything you know, but Ray feels so much. Right. And she's still okay for now. You know, it it hasn't really like corrupted her one way or the other yet. What do you think, Laura? I haven't really thought about any theories for what it means to be be perfectly (laughs) honest with you. I think, I think everything you've all said sounds far more informed Mm -hmm. than what I've thought about. I just saw the trailer and thought it looked cool. (laughs) Casual fan over here. At first I tried, I I was like, Oh, I'm going to try and say something. And then I gave up like a third of the way into the sentence. You know what, Laura, you're still valid as a fan. Thank you. I appreciate that. I uh, so when you hear Palpatine's laugh at the end of the trailer, I didn't right. know who that was. I didn't know who the Emperor was. I had to ask somebody. Did you try to hide it? <laughs> oh, I did. Yeah, I, feel I was like totally that's the pretend- wrong room to admit anything in. Right? Yeah, I was. I was pretending. I was like, "Oh man, oh shit!" I was like, "What the fuck does that actually mean?" No, but the cool thing was the actor who plays him came out at the end of the trailer, and he just stands on stage. Everybody's losing their minds, and he just goes roll it again and they, they play the trailer again and that was it that was his whole presence in on the panel just him saying three words roll it again it's kind of amazing um, though it was I feel, I feel better now because i knew that was him <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how casual of a fan i am mm-hmm. also uh lando i was really excited yeah, about lando cool. calrissian yeah yeah, he looked great. There was that great shot of him in the Falcon, just looking so mm-hmm. pleased. There was a line in Solo where... He was going to get his ship back. Right. right. He was going to get his ship back, and then Han said, over my dead body. And now he's dead, and he's getting his <laughs> ship back. <laughs> so, it's too soon. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think it's hilarious. It's really funny. <laughs> so we asked on Patreon, what do you think the Rise of Skywalker means? Amali said, I really like the idea of Skywalker becoming a new title slash order like Sith or Jedi. Maybe we could get some gray Jedi hints with Rey starting or inspiring a new order that is the balance between light and dark. Just please make it anything other than Kylo Ren. Victor said, in Revenge of the Sith, Palpatine talks about how Darth Plague, Darth Plagueis? could use the force to influence the... Oh my god, you guys, this is so nerdy. I can't even pronounce any of this stuff midi-chlorians to create life we've never learned in the films who anakin's father was but fans have theorized that palpatine created anakin i think the rise of skywalker refers to the birth of the skywalker lineage perhaps ray was created via similar means and that's why her parentage is a mystery finally thad says i feel the title will have multiple interpretations and meaning as the film progresses like most star wars titles do I am 99% positive that the title is not referring to a specific Skywalker, and seeing as this film is being promoted as the final chapter in the saga, that it is referring to the legacy of the Skywalker family and name. I would very much like to see Rey start a Skywalker order instead of a Jedi order. All good thoughts. So we've spoken about Disney Plus here on the show, and Disney finally revealed a ton of details about Disney Plus. They did it at an investor event. It's funny, this investor event had so much big news, and it was actually really exciting. Meanwhile, Apple does this very public event, and it's boring and void of any details. Disney hit all this at an investor event, which I thought was weird. Basically, everything that Disney owns is going to be on this. Their live-action movies, their animated movies, the Marvel movies, the Star Wars movies. 
most 20th century Fox content, including every episode of The Simpsons, is going to be on it. Over 100 Disney Channel original movies, known as DCOMs, are going to be on there. Uh, 5,000 hours of Disney Channel episodes are going to be on here. So much. And I was watching this event live. It was close to three hours. It was insane. (laughs) Because they wheeled out all these creators who were touting the projects they were working on. So I'm watching this for three hours. They saved the price and release date for the end. $6.99 a month. I literally screamed. I cannot believe how cheap this thing is going to be. Uh, you know the price is going to go up, though. It will but go up, but not anytime soon. I feel like the six ninety nine is the way to get people in the door. Right. But, I mean, I'm still going to buy it, so I'm obviously one of those people. I think the price won't go up for, like, three years. And Disney will be like, the price increase is... A reflection of the growing library of content we're making available to you. Yeah. No, I think it's it's really smart from a business perspective because they're going to have this whole um, like database of people using the service. And it'll be really easy to sort of like upgrade that service once they're already on a recurring billing plan. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't blame them. I think it's really smart, and I'm going to be one of those people. So, And what I find really interesting is that this is only a few dollars cheaper than Netflix is. And we can all easily justify Netflix because there's so much on there. But I feel like with Disney+, Plus, every most, most things on Disney+, Plus you are going to want to watch, whereas most things on Netflix you do not want to watch. It's just, it's just Disney has less content. It's still a shitload, but it's less, and you want to watch more of it, and yet it's cheaper. Do you know what I mean? So it just seems like insanely competitive, and I wonder what this means for the other streamers. It definitely makes the fact that the other day Netflix prompted me when I logged in to like watch something. It was like, hey, FYI, uh, your subscription's going up to eight ninety nine a month. Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Makes that look kind of shitty. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna use that to uh, pump up all the stuff they have coming down the pipeline so you'll have to stay. Yeah. Stranger Things is coming. They wanted to raise the right. price before that in July. That's true. Yeah. I still don't care. I think even that is still a reasonable price, and I, it's less than cable. You're only paying eight ninety nine a month. I'm paying like double that. Really? Are you paying for like the HD? Yeah, I'm paying for the HD. Oh, t- fuck that! I'm not gonna pay for that. <laughs> Wait, you pay for the basic, but you you stream Netflix in standard definition? I mean, I have <laughs> a really nice TV, so it looks good. Does anyway. it? Does yeah. It? I'll be the judge of that and come down there to inspect. Okay, you can come hang out if you want. You didn't <laughs> need to make that kind of excuse, but <laughs> all right. No, but um, I pay, I do pay for the Ultra HD, which is the 4K. And then the other thing is that you can watch on four screens at a time. And me and my mom, my sister and brother all share the same Netflix account. Oh, yeah. you know what? When me and Mark are going to be merging our Netflix accounts soon, so maybe once we do that, we'll upgrade. Yeah, because it's still cheaper than the cost of two regular subscriptions. Yeah, get the HD picture, Laura. Treat yourself <laughs> to, to a modern television picture. <laughs> yeah, I'm clearly, I'm clearly missing out so much. <laughs> I'm just not privileged like you, Andrew. It'd be funny if we looked back on episodes of Millennial and we hear all these times where Laura like missed details in episodes of Netflix shows. <laughs> and now we're like, finally, we realize why you were watching in standard definition. <laughs> Pam, what do you make of all this? Um, well, I think that, first of all, Disney Plus is going to be super appealing to families. Obviously, there is family content on Netflix, but it's not all family content on there. So I think that uh, this is definitely going to be appealing for, uh, you know, people that are trying to entertain their kids as well as themselves. Uh, Disney's never been more popular in general. And I know all of us millennial kids love us a good you know, Disney Channel marathon or Disney movie marathon. So they're definitely not going to be lacking in 
uh, subscribers. But I, I do agree with Laura that uh, the price is going to go up. And I'm curious to find out how others seriously compete with this. Because it's getting oversaturated and Disney Plus is not while it's the most highly anticipated streaming platform coming, it's not the only one that's coming down the pipeline. Warner Brothers is also working on theirs as well. Yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. Compared to Disney Plus. I mean, the reason everybody is excited about Disney Plus, and I really do mean mostly everybody, I, it was a really popular article on Hypable because everybody just loves this idea of being able to pull up any Disney movie at any time. It's the dream. Meanwhile, HBO, they charge at least $10 a month. CBS All Access, I think, is the same price as Disney+. Plus. Showtime is another 10 bucks a month. Whatever Apple sets theirs at, they're only going to have like 10 shows and no library of old content that they can throw on there. All of these have way less content than Disney Plus is going to. So all of these need to be like $2.99 a month or $3.99 a month. Do we know if um, Disney is going to allow multiple people to be logged into a single account? Because I feel like that's part of the flexibility with HBO Go, right? Like, right. Yeah, it's more expensive, but they also don't care if you are sharing it with your friends. Right. You know? We don't know that yet. I would assume that Disney Plus is going to start at six ninety nine, and then maybe for eight ninety nine or nine ninety nine, you can get multiple accounts. Or multiple user profiles, simultaneous streams. I don't know. Okay. Actually, they did. They Disney Plus did show off the profile feature where you'll be able to have different user profiles under one account, and they didn't mention that that would cost more. So maybe that you will be able to have simultaneous streams. Sarah, will you be buying this? You have kids. Yeah, oh, of course. I'm so excited. But I'm also like a huge D- Disney freak. So I will definitely, I mean, just for Moana alone, it'll be worth it. <laughs> oh my God. I love that soundtrack so much. It's it's fantastic. My two year old is she loves to sing. It's one of those things where if she's tan if she's in a major tantrum, I can play the music and she'll calm down immediately. So <laughs> it's magic. You know what works. That's good. Yeah, I definitely I definitely plan to sign up. But um, I am as I asked my dad if he knows anything about the WB streaming um, uh, streaming service because he might have heard something about that because he works at warner brothers and what did he tell you give us the scoop i'm waiting for him to get back to me i'm sure he'll mention something before uh he's been um he was working on his last project was he was transferring all of the Baywatch episodes um for streaming oh so, that's cool very interesting um so i don't know where those are going to be showing up but he was uh he was told that they make sure that there are tits and ass in every shot so (laughs) seriously (laughs) my dad's job is a is in post-production as a colorist Mm -hmm. and so what he does is he will go he goes through and does restoration and film color correction and so um for all of these older shows that were shot on film uh, he has to adjust for HD um, streaming. And so he has to make sure that the um, the letterboxing is showing the right part of the picture. So they oh, wanted him to make sure that the boobs are always visible <laughs> in the shot. Pam, I know you wanted to talk about how Netflix and maybe others are going to try to keep up in these streaming wars. Yes. So uh, this is definitely all stuff that Netflix has had in the works for a while, but it is kind of interesting that you're seeing Netflix kind of branch out to what is more commonly referred to as more traditional media. And it makes me kind of wonder if going forward, this is going to be what gives them the edge to kind of compete. Because if streaming platforms can't compete with, say, Disney's crazy, insane, super low price point, then they might have to think of other means of revenue coming in, you know, to, uh, to keep the funding going, because, you know, obviously, like money has to show up for you to keep making all of this original stuff for you to acquire things. So uh, 
Netflix has actually had a very interesting week in the news. Uh, and over the past week, they have launched a Sirius XM station titled Netflix is a Joke Radio. It actually kicks off today on Channel 93, and it's going to feature a bunch of comedians that are super notable that have also partnered with Netflix in the past on recent comedy specials, including Adam Sandler, Aziz Ansari, Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, Jerry Seinfeld, John Mulaney, Ricky Gervais, Sarah Silverman, Wanda Sykes, and many more. They're also launching a print magazine tentatively titled Wide. This is actually going to be released right around the time that Television Academy voters gear up to vote for the Emmy nominees. And that is going to profile new projects coming down the pipeline and also feature interviews and features with people responsible for making these shows a reality. Uh, so that's set to debut in June and it's actually going to be free. So that to me kind of sounds less like a magazine and more just like a promo pamphlet, but we'll see what happens between now and then. There's not too much in terms of like finite information uh, to go off of there. And then finally, this was really big for film Twitter specifically. Netflix is also reportedly in talks to purchase Hollywood's iconic Egyptian theater. So if you've ever come out to visit Hollywood and gone to see the Walk of Fame and the Chinese theater and the hand and footprints in front, then chances are you also walked by the Egyptian theater. It's actually kind of adjacent. Uh, so it's not the main theater that you see in like the bigger, like more traditional old school Hollywood Um premieres and stuff, but it is a historic landmark. Uh, Sid Grauman, who uh, built the Chinese theater, also built this one in the 1920s. And it's the site of the first ever Hollywood premiere in 1922 for Robin Hood. So this is very interesting, given that Netflix is currently battling people like Steven Spielberg over, you know, whether or not they're, they should be allowed to compete in the Oscars or more traditional cinema is celebrated. Um, so the plan is for Netflix, if they acquire this, to use it for special screenings during the week of their original content, but also allow the Egyptian to host special screenings, talks, festivals, and stuff like that on the weekends. Uh, so definitely Netflix has their hands in more pockets than we thought, basically. Yeah. I fucking love this. I love, I love that their response to Spielberg being like, you shouldn't be able to qualify for the Oscars if you don't play your movie in a theater is to be like, fine, we'll buy a fucking movie theater. (laughs) Yeah. I think it is kind of the biggest slap in the face. And it's funny because now everybody's like, you can't do that. This is like a big theater in Hollywood. And Netflix is over here like, well, they need money. So watch us. Yeah. A lot of film snobs feel that way. I'm like, who, who cares? I can see why Netflix has to branch out, but I don't, but if you look at the other streamers, they already are branched out. Netflix started as, of course, the uh, you get DVDs in the mail, which I actually kind of miss. That was fun, receiving movies in the mail. And you could actually still do that, believe it or not, through Netflix. But, um, you know, they started as a watching movies company, and now they just keep growing and growing, and... As you say, Pam, they got to keep the money coming in, and any good business is going to look to expand. So, yeah, they're they're sticking. Uh, you know, they're trying to grow in other ways, and I think it's really smart. Um, they also do a lot of merchandising for some of their more popular TV shows. Like, there's a ton of Stranger Things merchandise now, and those licensing deals alone are probably worth a ton of money. That's a good point. So good for them. All right. Uh, before we move on to a Game of Thrones discussion, as well as some listener feedback and some Puff the Magic Dragon, we've got a quick word for you from one of our sponsors, BioClarity. BioClarity comes with everything you need to get clear, glowing skin and is packed full of detoxifying nutrients that help get rid of breakouts and clears and calms your skin. Their green skincare line offers essential products to help keep your skin balanced and on track with daily nutrients. I have a lot of redness in my face personally. And over the last year and some change, BioClarity has really helped tone that down. So it's become a regular part of my skincare routine. I personally use the essentials routine for normal or dry skin. It's a three-step regimen that is packed with gentle nutrients that nurture your natural radiance. It comes with everything you need to nurture, hydrate, and restore your skin. In just a three-step regimen that's packed full of detoxifying and calming nutrients, um, plus Floralux, which is made from plants, you can actually help soothe your skin and you're going to notice a healthy glow over just 
the first couple of weeks. The three steps in this routine are cleanse, restore, and hydrate. These products are 100% vegan, cruelty-free, paraben-free, sulfate-free, and artificial fragrance-free. On top of that, BioClarity offers a 100% risk-free money-back guarantee. Get healthier, more radiant skin by going to bioclarity.com. And right now, for my listeners, you'll save 40% on skincare routines, plus an additional 15% off everything on their website. That's an incredible deal, but you need to enter our code MIL at checkout. So go to bioclarity.com and get 40% off skincare routines plus an additional 15% off everything on their website when you use our code MIL at checkout. Your face will thank you. So Game of Thrones premiered on Sunday night. HBO announced how many people watched. 17.4 17.4 million viewers across HBO platforms on Sunday night. It was also HBO's biggest night of streaming ever. By comparison, the season seven finale had 16.9 million viewers and the season seven premiere had 16.1 million. So it continues to grow. And as people who couldn't tune in on Sunday night catch up, this premiere will easily crack. 20 million viewers and that's insane for a premium cable network plus you factor in all the viewing around the world all the torrenting we all know that game of thrones had that problem big time because it is behind a uh, paywall Uh, so a lot of people (laughs) watch it illegally it is it's got to easily be the biggest show on the planet right now did you all watch of course come on who do you think we are Right. You all talk about it because I watch, but I don't know what's happening. So I actually don't watch. <gasps> oh, so it's just you oh, and me, Laura. Oh, Andrew, you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, for once. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I I read the first book, and after um the the last character main character died in the first book, I was like, what's the point? And that was it for me. <laughs> so what you two think? And I guess you can spoil it, right? I don't think we're gonna give. Okay. I didn't have any plans to give specific spoilers. Um, so I I have a complicated relationship with Game of Thrones because I have felt that ever since they went off book, the writing took a significant dip. And I feel like the writing for the last couple seasons has just left a lot to be desired. Um, I'm also worried that they have somewhat backed themselves into a corner with everything that they have to resolve in only six more episodes. Um, Not all of which are an hour and a half long. Apparently like the first two or three are only an hour long and it's only the last like four or so episodes that hit the hour and a half uh, amount. That said, I enjoyed myself. Um, there was a reveal that was made that we all obviously knew was coming. And I was kind of glad that they didn't drag their feet on that because they really do have so little time to resolve everything that they need to resolve. Um, so I was glad that they didn't try to turn that into like a half season arc of, um, you know, John finding out about his incestuous sex life. Um, <laughs> cause we all already know. Um, I really like for me, the bar is set kind of low because I'm personally house Tyrell and they're all dead. So I don't really care who wins. I just want Daenerys to die because I hate her. Her character aggravates the shit out of me. Um, Jon Snow's not too far behind her. He's just so boring to me. And if either one of them ends up on the Iron Throne, that outcome will just feel too neat for a show that has been like so Machiavellian and so political. Um, so yeah, I would really like it for Sam to kill Daenerys. I think that would be cool. I'd be down for that, um, Pam. Yeah, I think that for all that Daenerys has, you know, brought up the fact that we're not our father's children. Cause she said that many, many times over the course of the last few seasons leading up to this grand final season. I don't quite believe that she is um, immune to Mm-mm. the uh, insanity that runs in her family. And I think that 
like John, although yeah, maybe he should technically be the one that sits on the Iron Throne. He's like in no position to rule a place that's so unpredictable like Westeros. He's way too noble. He would die in an instant and be overthrown. And then the whole story would be right back where it started. And that would be really unsatisfying if you were to think about what would come after. So I think like, I don't really care who sits there because maybe the lesson is that, you know, whoever sits there is kind of doomed to be a terrible person. I think at the end of the day, I'm just very much team Sansa and team Arya and like by proxy because of Arya team Gendry. And so as long as nothing happens to those three, I'll be fine. Um, It was a nice episode in terms of reunions. And while it is a little bit of a filler episode, given that nothing like really happens, uh, and especially given that there's not a lot of show left, I do feel like it was necessary because you kind of need to move all of the key pieces where they have to be in order for us to get any kind of conclusion to this crazy saga that we've all kind of been following along with for the past few years. So I'll be interested to see how they wrap things up because like you, I'm very apprehensive that they don't have enough time to do it. Yeah, I'm just invested at this point. Me too. No matter how bad it is, I'm going to watch till the very end. (laughs) We're having fun watching, though, aren't we? Oh, Oh, my God. Yes, for sure. Twitter's on fire. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, I mean, obviously, we're trying not to get into like too much specifics, but I think that like the, the tension, for example, that they've set up between a bunch of characters now, like not necessarily just Sansa and Danny, which they've been teasing for the last two years that they've been off um, is very, very interesting to me. And I'm curious to find out how that changes, how people react to certain characters as well. Because at the end of the day, it is kind of like a show about people and what they do when faced with these extreme cases, as much as it is about, you know, dragons and uh, what did what does Laura call him? Icy boys. <laughs> <laughs> Icy boys. Uh, I will say, I, I am unsure about Game of Thrones on a whole because, again, I don't really understand. For anyone who doesn't remember, I kind of got into the show like halfway through the series. I didn't watch the first half of the series, which I know is stupid. And now I'm just watch watching just so I can understand what everybody is talking about. Monday at the water cooler. I want to be a part of the action. Um, But what I will say about Game of Thrones is that it is the last appointment TV series. You have to watch live or the day after because everybody is talking about it as it is airing. And we just don't see that anymore. I miss it. I wish Netflix would stream premieres live so we could all talk about them at the same time. It's just a fun community event. So yeah, it is fun because we actually had a friend over with us last night and we ordered pizza and drank pork and we just made an evening of it. And yeah. it it is kind of like a throwback to like, oh, I remember college. I feel like this still happened when we were in college, right? Yeah. Appointment mm-hmm. TV shows. Or Breaking Bad. Everybody tuned in every Ooh, Sunday for that. Yeah. yeah. Or Lost. Lost. Yeah, of course. I remember Lost. For me, it was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> which makes me very old but uh but yeah Buffy the Vampire Slayer and I used to sit down with my mom for Gilmore Girls that was a big one for mm. that's cute yeah all right well this has obviously been a very entertainment focused episode of Millennial and we're going to turn our attention to some feedback and pot is it okay to call it pot or is that like demeaning I I think um I mean I call it weed so Okay. I'm probably just as guilty. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, our second sponsor this week is ZipRecruiter. Hiring is challenging. And I know this. It can be a struggle to find the right person to hire at Hypable. But there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash millennial. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just one click. Then ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting so you receive the best possible matches. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you. It will find them. 
ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. And with results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash millennial. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash millennial. ZipRecruiter.com slash M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. That's how I got my job. Oh, really? Yeah. How long have you been at that job? Since January 1st. Oh, awesome. Are you enjoying it so far? I love it. I love it. I am I'm a, a marketing and events manager for a nonprofit here in San Diego. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. So uh, I the cool thing about ZipRecruiter is that they will text you if they have a position that looks that that aligns with what your resume is. And they'll also um, give you some tips on how to improve your resume. And um, it also lets you know if, if the person has looked at your resume and whether they've taken a second look. And so that so that was really helpful in my job search. Oh, great. Glad to hear. Perfect timing having you on this week. Yeah. ZipRecruiter.com slash millennial. <laughs> <laughs> we got some feedback about last week's episode. This is from Kate. Just wanted to chime in and say that gluten can still affect people who don't have celiac. Like, I'm not going to die or anything, but I will have intense, painful gas and constipation for days. You don't want to be around me if I've had gluten. <laughs> yeah, so you, you can have an intolerance. Mm-hmm. That is definitely possible. Um, I think for me, where I mostly get aggravated is we we know that the number of people who actually have celiac disease is pretty low. And yet it's become kind of a trend for people to claim they have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, because it's like, oh, look, I'm cutting edge by avoiding gluten. Exactly. I know that um, in in some studies, and I, I have seen this, that um, children with moderate to severe autism, um, they will generally follow a gluten free diet because it cuts down on their um, their self injurious behavior and tantrums. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that we probably consume too much gluten in this country. Like when you think about just the amount of like breads and pastas and stuff that we eat it's probably too much for you but we also consume way too much red meat we also got some feedback about pat's gmo discussion last week laura do you want to take the first one sure this is from emma emma says thank you pat in all caps growing up on a farm in rural oh gosh minnesota Min- thank you i was like wait is that minnesota or montana and then i felt really stupid or muggle um, <laughs> Minnesota. Uh, it drives me crazy when people start to vilify farmers. GMOs do not deserve the bad rap they get, especially from people who aren't entirely sure what they are and why they're used. With a decrease in those choosing farming as a profession and the world population increasing, being able to modify foods to survive harsher climates or grow with less water is critical. Um, don't get me wrong. I'm happy that we as a nation are finally taking our health more seriously and really trying to understand what's in our foods. But I think that we go too far off track and get focused on the wrong aspects. Like you said, there are only 10 approved foods on that list that are recognized as being true GMOs. But everywhere you go, the non-GMO sticker is stamped on most foods because marketing companies know it will catch the consumer's eye. Yeah. Oh, no GMOs in that? Great. I want that because I'm going to be eating healthy, I guess. Right. It's always easy to make something sound good if you're like, it doesn't have this. Right. Exactly. It doesn't give you cancer. This one's from Liz, who says the concerns of food safety versus environmental risk are very different when it comes to GM crops. We recently only started mass cultivation of them in the States in the 1990s, which wasn't that long ago. And while there have been many studies that have looked into the impact of GM crops on the ecosystem, their long-term effect could could take even more decades to understand. 
One study found that at first, when a GM soy crop was planted, the use of herbicides declined, but similar to chlorine resistant bacteria or this drug resistant fungal infection currently being observed, the weeds that did survive produce tougher to kill offspring, requiring the farmers to use more herbicide in the long run. That's more herbicide on your food and more money in the farmer has to spend on herbicide. A study on GM crops found that the pollen of a particular GM corn is toxic to monarch butterfly larva. The pollen was coating wild milkweed growing adjacent to the GM corn. When studied in the lab, the monarch larva had a higher mortality rate on the tainted milkweed. This same GM corn was found to produce twice as much toxin in the soil, which over time may affect insects in the soil that don't feed on the crops but provide a service to their habitat. The limited knowledge on the long-term impacts of the environmental and the ecological consequences are one of the reasons I do tend to buy organic and or non-GMO free, depending on the product and its attached price tag. GMO free. You said non-GMO. Isn't that what I said? You said non-GMO free. Oh, my bad. (laughs) And or GMO free, depending on the product and its attached price tag. I don't go crazy. I tend to look the Dirty Dozen list, which is updated yearly, and stick to organic corn and soy as much as possible. We didn't really get into the environmental impacts of GMOs last week, so I was glad that Liz wrote in. Yeah. Somebody was so moved by the GMO discussion last week that they became a patron because of it. They literally said that. (laughs) I mean, if that's what it takes, you guys should write in and be like, yeah. talk about this and I will become a patron Yeah, and we'll sure. consider it. I mean, honestly, one of our Patreon benefits is that you do get to decide what we talk about at least once a month. So keep that in mind. <laughs> so Sarah, let's talk about weed with you. Word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> when you initially filled out the submission form for becoming a co-host you said that you were really passionate about weed and its benefits tell tell us how long have you been smoking how often why you're such a strong believer okay um so i the first time i ever smoked was my not when i was in sixth grade but the boy who was my sixth grade boyfriend when i was in my early 20s was like i want to get you high so I smoked out of a bong the first time and we watched the ring and, uh, who, you know, that was it. But, um, <laughs> that you know, like, like a bad choice. It was, it was a bad choice <laughs> all around. And I didn't really feel like I got high. Um, my, my, my usage didn't really ramp up until my second, my senior year of college. Um, I went to a, I went to UC Santa Cruz, um, which is a stoner school. And, um, I was sort of struggling with depression and, um, finding and, and insomnia. I had really bad insomnia. And so, um, I started to see a psychiatrist and she prescribed Lexapro and, um, Ambien for my sleep issues. And, um, and then she went on leave to get married and I had a a lapse in my medication. And, um, for those two weeks, I was extremely suicidal, very, very, like, I was just basically detoxing from the Lexapro. And um, my friend was like, why don't you just smoke? It seems to help you. And um, he was kind of right. So I started smoking instead of taking Lexapro. And um, I moved down to San Diego, and I lost 50 pounds. And (laughs) um was just it just ended up working out really well it ended up working out really well for me to manage my depression and my anxiety symptoms that's so interesting so i actually do myself partake um but i also take lexapro and i've been considering tapering off of it so it's really encouraging to hear that you had this positive experience yeah i um i I was at such a low point when I started the Lexapro that the Lexapro did what it needed to do to get me to like a base point of zero, um, where I was neither sad, but not happy. I was just like, what blah, whatever. Um, and it was the pot that sort of helped bring, you know, it sort of made me happier. I actually became much better on the soccer field and I didn't say as many stupid things and (laughs) it just ended up, 
it just ended up being really well. I also am not a heavy drinker, so it's not like I was mixing. Um, I mean, I was a regular at a bar, but um, I was I was pretty good at knowing my limits between the two. I did end up having to recently go back onto an antidepressant, but I'm on Zoloft now, and I still I still do pot in the evenings to sort of relax. Are you high right now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> But like when I when I was smoking, when I was smoking, it's like it's only been in the last few years when it's been legalized that um, that I've been I've been using a vape pen. Before that, I was basically smoking out of a pipe or a bong or, what you know, smoking flour. And there's various different ways that you can consume marijuana. And um, and so I was I would like smoke and then my friend and I would go on a six mile run or we would smoke and then we would go surfing. Or we would smoke and then go do like a workout or something, go hike or climb something. There are these caves that we used to climb to and smoke in those. Or, you know, like it was just kind of part of our activities, but we made sure that we were really active as well. So we weren't like the stereotypical stoners that just don't do anything. Right. Um, so, yeah. So that's part of the reason why, like I would smoke and instead of focusing on how much it hurt or like if I was tired or whatever, I would like use that time as sort of a meditation while I was running and the pot kind of helped me like, you know, block out all of the negative parts of running, you know? Interesting. I find it very interesting that you said it, it makes you happier as well. Like that, does it only make you happier when you are smoking or just in general? So, well, I would say that um, there are different strains um you so there's there are there are three main strains there's indica then there's a hybrid and then there's sativas so if you smoke a sativa dominant strain um there are certain strains that are uplifting energizing relaxing some of them induce an appetite that's for you know medical patients who are taking chemo and maybe are struggling with their nausea um, and, and so you, so there's just different strains and each strain does something a little bit differently for you. What strain can I take that won't make me paranoid? Because we'll get into this so, later, but I, I've had a problem where I get paranoid when I smoke. Okay. So, so you're probably smoking a sativa dominant and what you would probably more benefit from would be a hybrid an indica dominant hybrid or a straight indica strain that's generally (laughs) um indica is a more um night night go to sleep uh a straight strain of of pot and so you um a lot of people use that for insomnia, relaxation, and um, right. And now, with the pot industry being as regulated as it is, you can sort of tailor the the concentration that you partake in. So, like, so with like the vape pen, the cartridges have different concentrations. Can confirm. I also um I I lean more towards the indica side of things because I struggle with anxiety. Mm-hmm. And anytime I do a sativa, it just like makes my heart rate increase. And I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? Yep. Yeah. Why is this like this right now? But then if I stick with like a hybrid or an indica, then I'm just like, oh, like the world's happy. How do you yeah. spell indica? What? I N D I N D I C A. I C A. Okay. Yeah, Pat's been using the vape pen as well, because when we went to Vegas, he bought one, and then he stuck it up his butt or something to bring it on the plane. And he loves that <laughs> he thing. You didn't have to do that. Can't no, you just, you actually, can't you just travel with that now? You can, can you? actually. You yeah. can. You can, tra- you can travel up to a gram in your possession um, in states from states that have it legalized. Oh. Um, but in the case of the cart- uh, in the case of the vape pen, if you travel with them separately and put the cartridge like in your in your like toiletries bag in the very bottom, they're less likely to find it, and you can travel with a battery. And in fact, you have to carry a battery on your, in your carry on. But mm-hmm. I'm going I'm going to I'm going to Mexico in June, and so I was like doing some research on it. <laughs> Expert. <laughs> um but yeah he loves uh, that thing and he'll he'll puff that in my place all the time and i like it because there's no smell associated with it like he'll blow that out 
and I see it, but you don't smell it at all. It's pretty great. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to run through some numbers to uh, get everybody up to speed. So the number of states that have legalized recreational marijuana is at 10 plus Washington, D.C. The number of states that have now legalized medical marijuana is up to 33. The total number of countries who have legalized marijuana on a national level, just two, Canada and Uruguay. Um, the overall value of the marijuana industry in 2018 is $10.4 billion, and 250,000 people are employed by the marijuana industry. So it's big business and growing rapidly. And I was looking at what states, which states might be next to legalize it. New Jersey, Vermont, New Hampshire, Hawaii, and New Mexico all have votes coming up this year. Where do you three see weed going in America this year? I I would love to see um, the medical profession um, facilitate some more studies so that they're able to um, be more helpful when patients are coming to them for alternative medicine choices. Um, my grandfather passed away to about a year ago. And, um, in the last year of his life, he was struggling with severe amounts of pain and the medication that they were prescribing him was not doing, it wasn't enough. So I ended up, I ended up helping to facilitate getting him some medicated chocolate bars. And, um, my other grandfather passed away from cancer and my grandmother um, my grandma in the nineties cooked pot into brownies for him, um, while he was going through chemo. Wow. So I just, I think, um, when you, when you go to the doctor now and you ask about how can I, how can pot help me as a more natural medical substance, doctors are not able to say anything about it. They can't give you any information. They can't advise you. And I think that that's a real disservice to patients because, pot could be a a better option for many, many people for many, many different, you know, pain management, uh, you know, anxiety management, pain management, and sleep, you know, sleep deprivation management, that kind of thing. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. there's just, and it doesn't have to be smoke. I also think just the approach of doctors matters. Like I'm really lucky in that um, my primary doctor very much treats weed like he would treat alcohol. You know, like when they're asking you, how much alcohol do you consume a week? And it's not really a question that comes from an area of judgment. Right. It's just part of your, your medical background. And they ask the same thing about pot. Right. And when I told him about my habit, he was like, okay cool. (laughs) He just like wrote it in the chart, like it was nothing. And so I think that's also a good place to start is just, you know, people with medical backgrounds helping to normalize it by not demonizing it. Um, I also hope just in, if we're talking about the long view, I want to see it legalized and I want us to tax it. Yeah. Cause look at how much money Colorado has made. Yeah. Exactly. I was going to say it's legal here in California now, too. And I don't think that in any of the counties that I've lived in, uh, which is not very many, but, you know, um, they're mostly like more liberal counties. And so I don't think the stigma is as big, but I think that the stigma like surrounding weed is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the great thing about it being legal now is that anybody can walk into a dispensary without having it like feel like they're doing something wrong or that it's taboo. And so anybody that's been a little bit curious about it can now go and check it out and see that it's really not that bad. And a lot of those people are super knowledgeable too about everything and like interested in uh, teaching the community about what they do. There's a lot of smaller businesses that have been on the rise as well out here in terms of, you know, making edibles and stuff like that. I actually have a distant cousin that uh, is, uh, she she kind of does like more foodie stuff and she uses all natural ingredients when she's cooking uh, her edibles for the business that she runs and uh, she shops locally for the other stuff that she puts in there. And so mm-hmm. I think you're kind of seeing people get more and more creative with it, which I think is probably going to help break down a lot of those um, lost kind of few walls that people 
have surrounding, um, you know, the people that choose to uh, enjoy marijuana in all its forms. So, yeah. yeah and Andrew, you would love this because like I was able to walk into a dispensary and it was very much like walking into like a winery and being like, I'm looking for something full bodied, but mellow. Right. Like I literally was able to go up to the counter and be like, Hey, I have a lot of anxiety. I need something super mellow. What do you recommend? Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. That's that. That's what blows me away is how marijuana is being normalized at that level. Now where you can walk into a store and ask for tips, like you're shopping for a computer. <laughs> I yeah, they're called something. bud tenders. Yeah, right. Yeah. So Pat and I went into one of those stores. I didn't ask any questions because Pat was there to buy. He spent a lot of money in that store, but it was a Pretty very cool experience. So Sarah, I have another question for you. Um, okay. You're very open about your marijuana usage, which I think is fantastic. You also, mm -hmm. you, you smoke it a lot, it sounds like, and you have kids. I'm wondering, do you tell them about it well, they're, they're, they're four and two. So even if I were to tell them, I doubt they'd get it. Um, right. the, but the, uh, the, the lot larger issue is when they get older, if they come, if they, I, I'm not going to say, you know, here, smoke some pot, but I am going to say, you know, if, if they're curious about it, I will talk, I will educate them about it when yeah. they're older. Um, and I think that, I didn't, I didn't smoke until after I turned 21. So that is possibly why I have a different view of it than someone who smoked in high school. And, um, and so I, I think that if they were to come to it on their own, I would be happy to be open with them and, you know, maybe smoke with my kid when they're 21 or whatever. But... <laughs> happy 21 <laughs> child. It's time to light up. Yeah. Um, but you know, that it, it's going to be something else when they're kid when they're a little bit older, you know, it'll yeah. be, it'll be, you know, it'll be something else. I, I do think that, um, there, so I, there was a study, um, done a lot. I don't exactly know when the study was, when it was done, but I found this, um, oh, in 1991, they studied the, the development of 59 Jamaican children from birth to ages five years um, of mothers who use marijuana during pregnancy. And full disclosure, I did not use marijuana <laughs> during either of my pregnancies. But um, when you suffer from morning sickness as a pregnant woman, they prescribe you Zofran, which is an anti-nausea that they normally prescribe chemo patients. And um, it can it can cause birth defects, but they still they still prescribe it to you. Um, and I would like to see, and, and so this study is like, is an argument for what are the effects of marijuana on a, on an unborn fetus. And what the study basically showed in those five years was that the children of the mothers who did smoke had less social anxiety than the children of mothers who did. And that right. there were no other developmental issues because all of the studies that um, are currently accepted are looking at um, the likelihood of somebody who smokes tobacco and marijuana and how that affects kids rather than, and there's been no studies of the effects of, of just exposure to marijuana. So, yeah. um, so I, I find that to be, I feel like there are definitely some other options out there, especially when the um, cannabidiol that is present in a plant that won't get you high, but will still, that still has pain management properties. Um, it's also found in, in mother's breast milk. Hmm. So babies are already getting high off, the, off of CBD when yeah. they're breastfeeding. So, um, you know, the question is, is how, how long-term, long-term, like up till they're 18, how does it affect their abilities when they're in high school is, and, and the, the study was stopped at five years. So we don't actually know that, but, um, so I, I just think that it's all a conversation, just like it's a conversation about alcohol. You treat it right. just like you treat alcohol and you make sure that you, you kids use it responsibly. Do you smoke in front of your kids or your kids like, mommy, oh, what's no. that? Oh, okay. no, 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 no. What no. do you do? You just go into a different room? Well, they go to bed at seven, so I usually wait until after that. 
Okay. Or I'll hide in the bathroom if I'm having a particularly difficult day. (laughs) (laughs) Exhale out the window in the bathroom. (laughs) Oh yeah, or you just turn on, turn the fart fan on, and just blow up through the through the (laughs) the fan. Fart fan. That's an I never (laughs) thought to call it that. We call it the poop fan. The poop. (laughs) Yeah. Growing up. My dad would instill in us that just to always turn the fan on to create some noise because even when you're peeing, you make noise too. So I just always turn that thing on. A couple of oddball questions here. So I just want to ask the panel, favorite type of edibles? I think Sarah Uh, should go first. (laughs) She's the guest of honor. I do sometimes purchase sour gummies. Okay. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna do edibles, my brother in law makes me cookies when I go up to visit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a fan of cookies if we're gonna do edibles. Um I've got actually one last peanut butter cookie that I've been saving. Oh, those are the best. <laughs> They're so good. Uh. I used to um I used to buy from, from the, she was my boss at Starbucks and, um, she, uh, she used to just give me, she would make weed butter and just give me the weed butter. And then I would make cookies and then take the cookies to parties and sell them. Weed (laughs) butter. My God. Just weed everything. Well, yeah. I mean, that's how they make edibles is by decarboxylating the, the weed in the butter. It sounds like you two have your smoking under control, but the last time I had an edible was when I had my major panic attack while smoking. Um, I had had a brownie or (laughs) maybe two, and it was the classic (laughs) case where I didn't feel anything for the longest time. So I think I had had like a second brownie and I was was drinking. Oh my God. And then so it finally hit me probably like oh. two hours into it. And I think I've told this story on Millennial before. I had this uh, panic attack where I felt like I was my brain was sinking. The only way I could stay afloat was if I kept repeating <laughs> facts. So I was with Matt at the time. This was like 2008, 2009. So I just still remember sitting at home on our couch he's holding me and i'm like my name is andrew sims i live at 601 california (laughs) repeating my phone number just repeating my address over and over i called ben i was like ben am i gonna die like fucking classic case oh man (laughs) so andrew life pro tip when you're doing an edible yeah eat only like If you're really sensitive, start with a quarter. Yeah, I was going to say. And like, just work your way up. I usually start with half. And then after an hour, hour and a half, if I'm still not feeling it a lot, I'll have the other half. (laughs) (laughs) You you eat two full brownies. Well, that's that. That would fuck you up. So I, I, we did it at Ben's. And as you know, Laura, Ben is a bad influence. So I think he may have encouraged me (laughs) to have a little more. (laughs) <sighs> and yeah then we got home and but that was the last time i smoked really at all like i was just so turned off by it after that and i am so afraid of having another panic attack while smoking but i will try this indica i think if, yeah, I think if you try an indica tra- strain you'll be you'll be much better off i hope so um, i think this I actually can help me so i have a horror story um Back in like maybe about 12, 12 years ago, God, I'm old. Um, 12 years ago, I was hanging out, hanging out with this guy who was a car, car dealer at a, at a Saturn dealership. <laughs> Do you remember Saturn? Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, I had had like a tin of pot in my, in the trunk of my car that I had like hidden because my mom, I had let like long story short, I had left my tin with pot and everything out on the couch in my parents' house when I was home for the summer between college years and uh, between college. And so I, um, so the weed was kind of old. I had hid it in the trunk of my car and um, I was hanging out with him and we smoked. And then I, something happened and all of a sudden I fainted. <gasps> Ooh. And I and I woke up 
to him on top of me trying to wake me up. Oh my god. Like he had like he had picked me up and taken me to a bed. He was in medical school. Um there's this university in in the Caribbean on this island on the island of Granada and he was a student um during the school year at this medical school. And so he was like really he was like a medical you know, he's a medical student. So I felt like I you know, he wasn't going to attack me or anything, but I fainted so badly that he couldn't get me to wake up. So um so I, it, it was like really old weed and I don't know, I've never had an instant like that again, but, yeah. um, but it was really weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary. I think that like the best thing about honestly, m- marijuana getting legalized is that like you were saying before, Sarah, there's so much more control and information about the strands and like what exactly is in them. And, you know, you can go to a shop and you know that it's not laced with anything. They're going to tell you exactly what it's going to do to you. And they can advise you on how much you should take and stuff like that. Because I think that, you know, what all of people's horror stories have in common is that they, they didn't really know enough about what they were doing for the most part. And like the same thing happened to me with my one big horror story, which also involved an edible. And it was a, um, it was a chocolate truffle and they're so small that you don't think that you should eat less than the whole thing. And that was just like awful. Thank you. Truffle man of San Francisco world renowned. I don't even know what his name is, but everybody knows the truffle man. Um, but, um, but yeah, so like, I, I don't know. I think that I would be more inclined to try edibles now because I would know exactly what was in there and where it was coming from and who it was giving, who was giving it to me. versus like right after that happened when I just like didn't want to touch it ever again. And they have edibles that are intended for newbies too. Like they make this one thing called a rookie cookie and it's just a single serving cookie. (laughs) It's got five milligrams of THC in it and that's it. Yeah. I need that. So you, you know exactly what's in it. You know what the dosage is. Yeah. The last time I had an edible, somebody uh, gave me a Chiba Chew because I was curious about how, I might be able to use that like uh, medical marijuana to help me sleep better because I too suffer from insomnia. And that was kind of nice because like on the package right there, it said exactly how much was in there. And she was just like, start with half. And if you don't feel anything, you can take like the rest of it, but it's pretty mild. So you should be fine. And uh, it it was a lot nicer just kind of like going into things, knowing exactly what, what was going to happen most likely. So, yeah, yeah. I still um, occasionally buy from, I buy from, um, I, I buy non-legalized, <laughs> non-legal um, stuff. And I, there's a girl that I know that um, makes these medicated waters. And um, she made this, she makes this pineapple one. And I don't know how she makes it, but drinking, I don't know if you've ever drank your weed before, but it's, it hits you quick and it's just very relaxing. It's like drinking a beer kind of almost, but not carbonated. All right. I'm going to have to add that to the list of things to try. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. Good stuff. Well, thank you all for discussing that. I think you may have inspired me to try marijuana again. Well, Andrew, I also, can, what I would recommend for you as well is um, keeping like a small notebook. And um, if you're going to try different strains while you take them, write down how you feel so that you can go. A lot of people when they're when they are smoking to manage a medical condition, what we what we recommend is that um, they pay attention to the each strain does something a little bit different. Some strains will give you the munchies. Some strains will, will suppress your appetite. Some, you know, some strains will make you super energized some will make you super sleepy and so you just have to sort of figure out what how how like what strain act like specifically works for you i have yeah. like three to i have like three strains that i like to like bounce between cool so good that's yeah. a great tip thank you we have one more sponsor this week who i'm really excited about because many of our listeners are people who either have side hustles or have their own full-time businesses or might be aspiring to create one If you run a creative business, you know how to make your clients look good. But if you're struggling with tedious administrative tasks, let HoneyBook do the work and make you look good. HoneyBook is an online business management tool that lets you control your client communication, bookings, contracts, and invoices all in one place. 
A couple of my favorite features at HoneyBook are invoicing and proposals. You can create invoices and have your clients pay you right through HoneyBook, making it easy to accept payments and keep your bookkeeping organized. You can also create beautiful proposals and contracts, and right through HoneyBook, you can accept signatures. I love that because accepting digital signatures makes it so much easier on both you and the client, and you'll look super professional because you're offering quick and easy agreements. I can't stand when people don't offer me an option to sign digitally. It feels archaic. With HoneyBook, your business will be on the cutting edge, and you will look super professional. Over 75,000 photographers, designers, event professionals, and other entrepreneurs have saved hundreds to thousands of hours a year thanks to HoneyBook's suite of beautiful and easy-to-use tools. It's your business just better with HoneyBook. Right now, HoneyBook is offering our listeners 50% off your first year with promo code MILL. Payment is flexible, and this promotion applies whether you pay monthly or annually. Go to HoneyBook.com and use promo code MILL for 50% off your first year. Get paid faster and work smarter and smoke less weed (laughs) with HoneyBook.com, promo code M-I-L-L. Or maybe you'll smoke more weed because you'll have more time. (laughs) It's time now for some recommendations. I want to recommend doing an accent wall. So I had my walls ripped open and the handyman said, you know, instead of just trying to match the paint color because it's going to look different even if you have the same exact paint color you should just repaint the whole wall so i did that and one of my walls now where my tv is is a blue called pacific highway and you know what it reminded me of pam that's kind of why i bought it (laughs) it's a really nice blue it reminds me of my days Along the PCH with Pam. <laughs> Aww. I, you know, I actually saw a little peek of your new accent wall because Pat Instagram storied it. It he looks did. very nice. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I'm, I'm happy with it. it. It just really changes a room because right now my entire condo is a light gray and it just makes it cozier. Per our discussion today, I wanted to recommend peanut butter weed cookies. Um, this, of course, comes with some caveats. Not recommending this to anyone under the age of 18. Also, if you <laughs> if you have any concerns about how this might affect you, I would also recommend speaking to your physician before you do anything. Don't sue us. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Get an email from a parent. My kid took a peanut butter pot cookie. That's, Thanks that's, to exactly, that's exactly what I was worried about. And I was like, mm, not going to get me. My kid's been clinging to me for hours, repeating his name, address, and phone number. And then I can be like, is this Andrew's mom? (laughs) I, you know, we've been having some really nice spring weather out here. So my mom and I went down to the farmer's market yesterday and it was a really nice day. And I hadn't been in a while. I was really surprised by how affordable and comparable the prices were on produce specifically at the farmer's market. So we were able to pick up some really, really nice uh, radishes and carrots and chard and um, kale and all this other really fun stuff that now I get to cook with for you know, a, about the same price or maybe sometimes even cheaper than what I would have paid for at the grocery store. And it's just really nice knowing that It's all going to uh, local farmers, too. Uh, They're like local business people, and everything's super fresh and tastes really great. So if you haven't been to your local farmer's market, you should uh, check it out and see if there's anything there that, you know, maybe is comparable to what you would buy at the grocery store because it's super fresh, and it's just nice to give back that way to the community. And Sarah, last but not least... Um, I am going to recommend, um, The Art Forger by B.A. Shapiro. It's a book. Um, so if you've not ever wondered about the art forging world or how people, um, how Degas painted his masterpieces, um, this is, uh, the story for you. It's about someone who, um, paints, their job is to paint repro, reprints of class, of classic uh, paintings and um, she's a Degas specialist and somebody brings her 
um, a supposedly stolen. It's based off of uh, a real story. There were several paintings stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, and um, they've never been they've never been recovered. And um, this uh, is sort of a play on that story. Is they supposedly found a fictional fifth painting that was stolen, and um, she's tasked with forging it. Okay. Cool. So it's a good good book. What are we talking about in After Dark today, Laura? We're going to be talking about a story that further reinforces the fact that being vaccinated is very important. We've got a little bit. uh, We've got a little bit of an outbreak situation potentially happening here in the U.S. So we're going to go over that story and ask some really important questions about in which circumstances should vaccines absolutely be mandatory. By the end of this discussion, will I be convinced to not return from England next week? I don't think you have a problem as long as, long as you're vaccinated. But if you're stressed out about it, you can just smoke some pot and you'll be fine. All these connections throughout the episode. <laughs> Love all the threads. <laughs> That'll be available at patreon.com slash millennial, where you also get other benefits like face to face, where we hang out with patrons live in a Google Hangout one weekend a month. We will also be doing a new breaking news installment later this week. We also have Hashing It Out, which is our pre-show discussion. And you'll get access to a host of other benefits as well, like our planning docs. You can listen to the show live. You can join our Discord. And we also make random posts there on Patreon about what's going on in our lives. Most importantly, supporting us helps us keep this show rocking and rolling. Sarah, thank you for supporting us. I know you've been a longtime supporter, and we really appreciate that. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Good. And don't forget to follow us on social media, twitter.com slash millennial show, facebook.com slash millennial show, and instagram.com slash millennial show. We hope everybody has been enjoying our posts on the various social media networks. Sarah, it looks like you actually came prepared with a closing song. Oh, did I? Oh, this isn't you? Is this the one that Pat wanted to play last week? (laughs) (laughs) Never mind. Sarah, Um, what what song? I I mean, I I could I could suggest a song. Yeah, what what are you digging right now? I'm I'm like going through like a like a like a retro phase where um I used to be really into ska music, and so I was playing the Aquabats for my kids. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, Pam. Yes, um, yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're a really funny group that is also they're also superheroes. And um I recommend Magic Chicken. Magic if Chicken. Find, <laughs> if you can find it. Yeah. I saw them at um a festival out here in, in San Francisco and it was gr- great fun. <laughs> <laughs> they are really they're really fun my um they actually played at my cousin's grad night in disneyland amazing oh cool yeah i think they played like noise pop or something out here and it was it, it was great it was like the they, best accidental show i've ever ended up at <laughs> yeah they actually used to have a cartoon show they used to have a um episode they used to have a, like a cartoon where they would save the world all right thanks everybody for listening i'm andrew i'm laura i'm pamela and i'm sarah Bye, everybody. See ya. That is uplifting. Scott <laughs> makes me so happy. <laughs> it does. It makes me happy too.